Welcome to the next Behind the Scenes with Project Phaedra. This time we're here with Lindsay Smith and the Plate Stacks at Harvard University. Hi Lindsay, thanks for talking with us. Hi, you're welcome. So I thought what I would do first is maybe show you what a glass plate looks like. Okay. So um, one thing to think about when you're uh, transcribing for Project Phaedra, you see a lot of numbers that start with a letter A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or B, four, eight, six, and what those are representing are the glass plates. So uh, let me turn on my lights, people, and I can show you a little bit what that looks like. So usually when you think of a photograph of the sky, you're probably gonna think of something like this, or yes. perhaps like this, where you have the black background with the white dots. Yeah. Um, and we have an example of that here on a glass plate. Ah, okay. So we'll maybe get you a closer up view in a minute, but sure. what you're looking at is pretty much what you would see if you look up at the sky. You have the black background with the white dots, but yeah. actually most of our glass plates are negatives, so they look more like this. And believe it or not, this is the same exact object, um, but what your eye can see on the negative is far more stars. The little black dots are all stars. Um, so usually the women computers who worked here would work on negatives because you can see far more detail that way. Ah, okay. I thought it was just because of the way the photographic technology was back then. So, I mean, okay. you, yes, you, that was how you would take them, but instead yeah. of transferring them all to positives, okay. uh, they would usually work on them with negatives. And we'll give you a closer view of what those look like in a little bit. Sure. Um, so just so you know, these plates are both from, so one of them, this one is from 1898, and this one is from, I believe, 1904. Oh, okay. So these are two plates from different dates, but same exact object. But are they the same mm -hmm. technology with that much difference in yep. time? Same oh, technology, all right. same, uh, same telescope, actually. And so we have other types of plates. So that one there is the moon. I like to show that one because okay. people really identify with the moon. So this image was taken in 18... 94. Okay. And then here's another one just so we can have a few extras. This is Orion Nebula, and okay. that one is from 1893. All right. So this is what a glass plate looks like. You can see we have a couple different sizes. Most of our plates are these 8 by 10 sizes, but these 14 by 17s are our best prized plates. Sure. So like they only did that if they were doing a big area of the sky or something? Or? It actually depended upon the telescope. So okay. the telescope we had in the southern hemisphere was the Bruce telescope. Okay. It was 24 inches. It was a the big bad one on, um, on the southern sky scene. Wow. And they took mostly these larger plates. So they okay. had a much deeper field and so the plates end up being much richer and you can see far more stars in okay. those types of plates. And the deep field means it like you could collect see. more light. Exactly. So you can see further. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. So um, some people ask how do they make a glass plate or why on earth would they take a photograph on a piece of glass? Yeah. And that was actually the technology back then. So we are so used now, used to um, digital photographs nowadays. We don't think how you used to have to make an image onto something first. It wasn't just going into your computer because there weren't computers, there weren't yeah. cell phones. <laughs> so um, what we would actually do, by the time this project started, about 1885 roughly. We have a few plates from before then, but when the project really took off, it was the mid-1880s. They had what were called dry plates, so we have a few packages of them here. Okay. Um, before that time, you had to mix your chemicals and lay it out on your piece of glass. It was really tricky, probably toxic. Yeah, not, exactly. Right? There were some with like mercury yep, and yep. Uh, cyanide mm -hmm. and, and stuff, they, right? And they were usually only sensitive while they were wet. So okay. you had to work really fast in the dark to get your image um, underneath your, to get your plate with its wet emulsion underneath your telescope. Um, but by the 1880s, they were using dry plates. So you would buy them in bulk, just like this, in little boxes. Okay. And you, it would be a piece of glass that already had a dried emulsion on it that was light sensitive. So it was okay. much easier to use and it made the project uh, easier for the people who were going to be doing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think, do you have any other questions before we move to another station? Um. That's like a really nice picture of the moon. So how long had they been taking uh, pictures before that one was done? Before that one. Because I know the first ones were like really tiny. Really tiny, yes. 
So the earliest photographs of the moon that we have now are at Woolbach Library, where I'm sure you are very familiar with that. And that yeah. is actually the team that is uh, running Project Phaedra right now. Yeah. And they are daguerreotypes. Okay. Um, and daguerreotypes were an earlier technology, much more finicky than these dry plates. And the earliest one I believe that we have is from 1849, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And then they go up through the 1850s. So okay. there are photographs of the moon prior to the 1890s different technology, okay. um, usually not as uh, easy to use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit more background on the photographic project, mm -hmm. we actually have over 500,000 of those glass play photographs. Holy and cow. Yes, that is a lot. <laughs> we don't know the exact number because there hasn't been an inventory in a really long time. So throughout the years, plates have been borrowed by researchers and never returned or broken, or actually in the 1960s, they weeded through the collection to get rid of anything that was fogged or wasn't any good. So we know we have over 500,000, less than 600,000, but right now we're digitizing the glass plates and taking inventory at the same time. Sure. So hopefully in a couple of years, we will know exactly how many there are. Um, and just in case anyone's interested, that project is called DASH. It stands for Digital Access to a Sky Century at Harvard. Okay. And just so you can see a little bit of what 500,000 glass plates looks like, believe it or not, you're surrounded by glass plates right now. Behind everything that is in this green metal, there are glass plates. So I will open these up for you. Wow. So this is how they're stored. They're up on their edges because if you lay them on top of each other, the weight could actually crack uh, each other. So wow. uh, I'll just pull a random one out here just so you can see. This is what a glass plate looks like when it's in its okay. nice little jacket. And we mentioned earlier that each glass plate has a letter and a number. So when you're transcribing, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when you're transcribing for the F Project Phaedra, you see A11287, that would be this plate. So okay. every plate has its own unique number. And just so you know, the letter actually stands for a telescope. So if anybody's interested in finding out more about that series that they're working on, they could always go on to our DASH website, this D-A-S-C-H, and you can learn a, bit, a little bit more <laughs> about the plate. We'll make sure we put the website it. at the end in the thanks, so okay. if people need more info, they'll be able to find you. Sounds good. No, so good. every plate also has a barcode on the back. That's how we nowadays keep track of these guys. Okay. So one of the things I know that they're hoping for Project Phaedra data after it's transcribed mm -hmm. is that we can go through and try to match up plate yes. designations with the actual plate that they were doing work on. So mm -hmm. that that's one of the reasons we really would like to have Phaedra you notebooks just, transcribed. Yeah. All right, so are we going to get to see where more of them are stored? Yeah, so just okay. to give you a little bit more of an idea of what 500,000 glass plates looks like <laughs> and how they're stored, we're going to just take a little bit of a walk. Okay. So keep in mind that everything that is covered in this green metal is actually hiding glass plates. Okay. So what we'll do, even along these edges here. Oh, wow, well, lots and lots of cabinets. Yes, yeah, many, many cabinets. And we have three floors of storage like this. Wow, did so, you have to like shore up the structure or pick oh, yes. a good structure? Oh, this okay. This building was actually made specifically to hold the weight of this many glass plate photographs. Okay. Yes, yeah. and it's actually <laughs> made with this brick and metal because they wanted it to be fire resistant. Okay. Because in the olden days, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Great Fire of Chicago, Great Fire of this, people were terrified of fire. So when they made this collection, or when they made this uh, building for the collection, they wanted to make it as fire resistant as they could for the 1930s. That's when this building okay. was made. So is it filled with asbestos? Uh, <laughs> so. Sorry, I don't know when <laughs> asbestos fine. was popular, but. <laughs> So let me open up one of these cabinets. Okay. You might have to back up where I have a tight space here. Yeah. So everywhere you look, every cabinet is filled to the brim with glass plates. So here, this is the B telescope. And this telescope was actually in the Southern Hemisphere, kind of like those large A plates I showed you earlier. Oh, okay. So some mm -hmm. of the, so, so plates from many different telescopes, not just the ones here at Harvard, are in this collection. Oh, only Harvard, but oh, okay. Harvard had donors back in the 1800s who gave money to set up like little satellite observatories in the oh, Southern okay. Hemisphere, yep. also other places in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so it originally started here at, in Cambridge, okay. but then um, as light pollution <laughs> became a problem, they actually um. moved out of Cambridge to take a lot of these photographs, so they had better views of the sky. Okay. Um, and over here, this telescope in particular is organized by, um, basically by their date. 
Okay. Other telescopes are organized by the region of the sky that they were pointing at when they were taking photographs. Okay. So it just depends what you're looking for. Um, but if you were a researcher who came here, we would, of course, help you find the exact lights <laughs> that you're looking yes. for. But thankfully, now that we're digitizing all of these, you would be able to go online. Anyone can do it, and you can put in your coordinates for what you want to look at, your yep. favorite star, perhaps. Right. And you can see how it's changed over 100 years because it will be all online for anyone to use. Can you Just sort it by observer? Uh, not yet. Okay. But hopefully, no, once okay. Project Phaedra is finished, we will <laughs> have all of this information from all of the different observers, all of the different researchers, so you could potentially, in the future, okay. be able to look for specific plates that Henry de Levitt used, or specific okay. plates that you know um, Wilhelmina Fleming used. Okay. Say you were looking at some of her research notes, you could then go and see the exact plates that she was looking at. Sure. So, so they don't actually write like uh, who took the picture on the not on the plates. All right. No, Good they to know. did used to do that in some of the notebooks. So all of these plates, okay. for example, these B plates had to yeah. come a very long way to get back to Cambridge once they were taken. Okay. So they also had notebooks that they traveled with, okay. and the notebooks had all of that metadata in it: who took the image, what time they took that image, the date, where they were looking in the sky. Okay, um, all the information is in notebooks, which actually the Smithsonian Transcription Center already yes. transcribed for us. Oh, good. So we are okay. very lucky that they did that. And I'm so <laughs> glad that they are also doing working on Project Phaedra as okay. well. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks.